hello everybody. All right, let me open the chat. Hey, Jeff, how's the mix? <laughs> hey, Simon. Oh, thank you very much. See, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little moody here. Uh, I mean, not emotionally, I'm from the lighting standpoint. I brighten myself up every time. That's better. Who else is here? Rohan is here, and Philippe, Sibyl, the lovely and talented Tim Farrell, Julio's here, and Luke, Cecilia. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm going to move myself over to that side of the screen for now. Feels better. It feels more natural, I think, for a picture in picture. Jeff, I don't want to jinx it, but I think I finally got the mix right. <laughs> oh, man. I just want to remind everybody to please uh, set the uh, chat window to all panelists and attendees. So if you want to say anything, we can, all, uh, we can all see what you're saying. We can all see what you're saying. I did just say that. And uh, if you do have any questions, uh, be sure to put them in the Q&A. In fact, uh, something different I think we're going to try for today. If anyone does have a question and you'd like to ask Valentine directly, just uh, click the little raise hand icon and I'll turn your camera on um, so you can ask the question. We'll give that a shot too. Oh, that's the end of the uh, inspirational music. You know what that means? That means it's time to start Logic Live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Logic Live. My name is Andy and I'm very happy for you guys to be here today. It's midnight there, Ron. Well, thank you for staying up, man. I really hope this lives up to the expectation. Um, oh, do me a favor, Ron, and, and uh, change your um, your chat to uh, all panelists and attendees. Thank you very much. All right, let's get this show on the road. My name is Andy. Hello, Julio. Nice to see you, my friend. And this episode of Logic Live is brought to us by Cynesis.io. These guys are my own personal reseller. They've been my reseller for 15 years, and we could not do what we do without their support. Um, if you have any questions at all about their remote workflow solutions, you can check them out at Cynesis.io. Cynesis.io uh, solutions, development, integration, and support, supporting flame artists since 1997. And... I would like to point out to everybody at the top of the show today that our friends at Cynesis have uh, come through on uh, another exciting offering in the Logic.tv um, swag bag, as we call it here in the States, and that would be the Logic.tv mask, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, that's right. Be stylish, make a statement, and stay safe all at the same time with the Logic.tv mask. I'll be giving some of these away today. Thank you very much. I think Charles Quinn is interested, so I know who's got I know. I, let's just hope uh, I get, if I get you for Secret Santa, Charles, you know exactly what's going to be in that stocking. That's right, the ever-expanding Logic Live swag bag. All right, let's talk forum.logic.tv. I want to thank everybody again for helping to make the forum uh, like the go-to place for uh, all things flame-related and visual effects-related. The forum has been uh, like growing and expanding beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, I believe uh, the stats haven't changed since last week, but we have over 700 users for those who haven't checked in. Uh, over 65,000 page views in a month and over 1,000 posts, new posts, uh, this month. And uh, time to respond for a new topic is less than 30 minutes. And I know that that's been one of the the, uh, the the great things that we were hoping to replicate from like the Facebook experience is if someone has a question or has a problem, that there'd be a quick uh, and timely response. And it certainly has delivered. So I want to give a huge shout out to uh, to Randy McEntee for all the hard work he's done in getting the, the forum going and keeping it running and also responding to everybody's uh, feedback. I know people have made feature requests and Randy has come through. So uh, if you haven't signed up to the forum, please go ahead and do it. Go over to forum.logic.tv, sign up today, and uh, and be a part of the community. So thank you very much to everybody. Well, let me see if I can't possibly figure this button out. Hold on. Hey, there we go. That worked. Uh, I'm really excited about today's presentation, and uh, I, I have to be honest, the most exciting thing for me, uh, aside from the topic of, uh, of color management, which is something I feel I never know enough about, is that uh, Valentine reached out to me, our guest today. He uh, has been a, 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 a frequent attendee on, on Logic Live, and he reached out to me and said, I have something that I'd like to present. I have a master class I'd like to give. And, uh, and how could you say no? I mean, it's just a wonderful gesture, and I think it like truly captures the spirit of everything that we're trying to do here. So I want to thank him, and uh, let's get underway. So Valentine, if you're there, yes, there I'm here. Hi, Kiev. 
Thank you. Hi. Hello, world. <laughs> Hello, world. World. Valentine. Valentine. World. Thank you. Good to see you again, man. We had a great run through uh, the other day, and uh, I, I just want to thank you again for doing this. Why don't you tell no us a problem. little bit about yourself and, and your background? And uh, I'm, my name is Valentine, and I been a colorist and graphics artist uh, in Ukraine, let's say for lots of years, because I started <laughs> uh, maybe some like 20 years ago in my native city, Kharkiv, then I moved to Kyiv to become a technical director on Fashion TV Ukraine, then it was some editing, then it was some VFX, then gradient sets, and I do it all. And uh, mostly I'm working on feature films, uh, on uh, form movies, so three features I grade, finished, VFX, uh, I don't know, made everything. That's everything. <laughs> uh, in it, uh, hit a big screen this year, and uh, of course, Chinese plague uh, stop this funny thing, but uh, still I've heard I've it. Okay, that's All me. right. Well, thanks again, man. Why don't we just dive right in? And again, if anybody has a question, please uh, either put it in the Q&A panel or click the raise hand button if you want me to turn your camera on okay. and, uh, and you can ask Valentine directly. Uh, let me figure yeah. out how I should... Hmm... PowerPoint. So now you, uh, where is it? You can see my presentation. And is it working? Yep, it's working. Okay, let's start. And why this masterclass or presentation or whatever you call it is about color management. And I try to explain it like for artists, not like for some software developments or researchers or something else. And uh, first of all, uh, everyone knows that color management is something we need to do, whatever you do. So you grade, you comp in something, you clean up in something, whatever. And uh, from my practice, at least, I found that almost no one know what he's doing or she's doing or whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, admitting like, that you have a problem is the very is an important first step, right? Yes. <laughs> it's important thing, but no one know how to use it. And uh, people just tick buttons and hope uh, everything will work then. So let's try <laughs> to dive a little bit deeper to understand how since working and uh, I'll try to be as software agnostic as I could. Sorry, I don't have flame on this workstation, but uh, I That's think okay. it, all of this applies, like you said, it's, uh, it's, it's all applies. Uh, it's uh, basically the same in all software. Maybe buttons should exist in different places, but uh, it all should work. Okay, and let's remember the good old times when uh, I think like 20 years ago when no color management was evolved in moving picture production and by moving picture it's also commercials, uh, web TV, whatever you do, just with moving pictures. Uh, if you was a fixed actress uh, in these times you get something from gradient department with big bold text do not touch a color or yep. will kill you or yep. will do something <laughs> bad with you because you don't have proper way to see what you do just do your thing and hope uh, that everything will work at the end uh, this is was uh, mainly because uh, the computers were not fast enough to make all since needed for color management in these days. And the second, because this topic was not researched deeply enough to uh, release all its potential. Uh, 
and uh, to answer what is core measurement and how it works, we first we need to understand how human vision works or biophysics of color. And as we know, uh, color is a some spectrum of uh, radio frequencies from 400 nanometers or something like that. I think uh, it's 380, but doesn't matter, to 700. That's uh, so what uh, human can see. And once again, if we have some scene, we have some uh, emitter of light, some lamp or sun or whatever. This scene's uh, shooting photons with uh, uh, some wavelengths. It reflects from uh, the objects in this scene and uh, this reflected photons uh, have some frequency between these two frequencies and uh, it hits our eyes. And uh, our eyes uh, at the end of it has, uh, on the retina, has two types of uh, color capture elements. It's cones and rods. And uh, we need to know only two things about them. That's rods, uh, we have it uh, much more than cones and uh, uh, rods uh, mostly responsible for luminance acquisition and cones uh, response for the different wavelengths, so for color, let's say. And uh, these things produce electricity and electricity hits our brains. Our brains adapt it and uh, we see a picture. And uh, why I'll talk about this, because um, uh, adaptive is the uh, most important part of this uh, whole process. Because our brains will uh, adapt to environment uh, we see picture we're looking at. And the same picture with same physical uh, let's say colors uh, would uh, appear as differently dependent on where we look at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of, uh, if you remember this thing that uh, we have cons much more quantities than words, we have much more luminosity informations that our brain receives and uh, human brain is uh, more sensitive to luminosity. Let's say it's maybe it's the best word uh, would be sensitive. And uh, uh, this luminosity can uh, perceive of this luminosity of, uh, versus uh, the same thing can be different dependent on where we uh, look at it. Now. Also, our brain is uh, adaptable. So it's uh, response to different uh, colors differently in terms of luminance. And now, uh, if you remember this picture about color uh, spectrum, imagine that uh, we bend this. So red and uh, purple become somewhere at the end, uh, bottom of the screen and green becomes somewhere at the top. And this diagram is basically the uh, result of this bending. So we just bend it to form uh, all hues that human can see and uh, obtain such a picture. You know, Valentine, there's something you said yesterday when we were going through this okay. that's so true about you when you talked about uh, perception, you know, and yes. and how like in, in nature, like the the grass outside is not green, it just absorbs red and it, blue it, uh, wavelengths. Perceives uh, green for us because it ab absorbs uh, uh, red and uh, blue wavelengths. Yes, I tried to explain to my client once that uh, the color that I was showing them was correct. They were just perceiving it wrong. 
and uh, they haven't called me back since. So I, uh, mm -hmm. but I understand that scientifically that we're correct. Uh, it happens. So always uh, <laughs> test your course on iPhone. It helps. I know. <laughs> Uh, okay, where is stop? Okay, what's the color space and what the fuck it is? <laughs> Sorry for the strong language, but uh, remember, I'm no. from Soviet Union. <laughs> that word means the same in all languages. That's okay. Yes. Uh, imagine we have uh, um, three color coordinates. So these things can have coordinates uh, in these uh, triangles, or I don't know how it's properly uh, called, but it ha has coordinates in it. And uh, if we take the maximum blue coordinates, our um, display or displaying device or capture device can uh, produce or capture device can capture. Mm -hmm. uh, every Display and device can show some kind of maximum blue, some kind of maximum green, and some kind of maximum red. And the same with capture device, it can capture some uh, kind of maximum blue, maximum green, and maximum red. Uh, so basically, basically, color space is more, it's a mathematical description of this device. And that no, it sounds like something terribly. Uh, it would be uh, hard to understand, but uh, basically it's uh, describe your iPhone or your monitor or your camera, Alexa, I don't know. And uh, every camera, if it sees something that uh, exceeds the spectrum, it just clips. And I don't know if you see me correctly. My microphone has some kind of uh, blue LED here. And I promise you that my web camera clips it because it's uh, super saturated. <laughs> I'll show you. It's, a, it's, a, it's what you, the, the chart you have here is a, is a very good way to describe. I think that uh, what always confused me, I, it, you know, coming from a I'm, I'm very old, and so I remember the days back when, you know, there was only film, or there was only one, you know, digital videotape. There was there were there was only one standard, and uh, I never understood how we got from that to where we are. But this is a perfect explanation. It's because there are so many different manufacturers of sensors and so many different manufacturers of displays, and um. obviously they all hate each other. Uh, or they don't have each other's phone number because uh, you know everything's captured differently and displayed differently. It's and, uh, and we don't understand those two. Not about hate or have telephone numbers. It's just uh, <laughs> uh, one vendor can do this, and yep. it seems that uh, this is the way to go. And other vendor can seems another way. It's uh, just uh, true. Uh, how it would be? Sorry, English is not my native language. <laughs> it's it's two sides of a problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so what we say is that uh, color space is uh, mathematical description of some kind of device, and this is triangle of color space, and volume in it is called color gamma. And uh, if we have something that exceeds color gamut, it's clips. It's not about luminance. It's always about saturation. And also, there is some one more thing that can be inside a color space. It's white point. And white point, basically, if we look at this triangle and we uh, proceed line from here to some here and from here to here and from here to here and I hope my mouse pointer is in. Uh, we have uh, how it, cross someone's here. It would be a white point. So when we uh, send the same stimulus to this device so if we talk about uh, eight bit signal, I think 
one to eight, one to eight, one to eight on those three channels will give you theoretically gray color. Basically, you not always perceived it as gray because it will be depends on environment. And uh, the gamma questions, uh, uh, gamma takes, uh, it uh, was invented to uh, overcome uh, problems with old computers. Imagine uh, 20 or 30 years ago, the max HDD you have was, I don't know, 100 gig megabytes, mm -hmm. 40 megabytes, something like that. And you need to store picture on it. And uh, if you capture it with linear light, how it would be in real world, uh, then it will take a lot of space. Uh, it should be at least 14 bits uh, to not produce bending. And the smart uh, guys invented the gamma correction so it overcome gamma of your monitor. Remember the old certain SRT monitors we have. Uh, so it gamma up on uh, your file, your CRT monitor gamma down and you see something at least linear, correct or close to it. And basically uh, it give us the other slides. I mean, uh, if we take real linear signal, uh, all dark information would consist only in uh, these lower parts of signal. And we waste a lot of bits for whites or bright parts of uh, picture. And this is not what we, what effectively, effectively we want to do. So we gamma corrected uh, and have someone uh, linear distribution or close to it. And color space conversion. There is, uh, the, uh, like we uh, I said, it's all about saturation. So if you have the standard monitor uh, or REC 709 or REC uh, sRGB or call it like that, it's called standard gun. So it has some coordinates uh, in our Triangle, it has this smallest triangle of these two. And uh, it's about saturation. So it can produce the max green, max red, and max blue. And to better understand of it, if you, and I think everyone watch Star Wars movie, that most of the movie, our colors fall uh, something in this triangle. And only blast, lightsabers, and uh, some saturated and bright parts. <laughs> uh, bright and items of a movie would uh, go something like that. So we can effectively see it only in cinema. Like I think that, that's a universal standard, the brightness and, and saturation of a lightsaber. Everybody understands yes. exactly what that looks like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And it give us one more thing that uh, we can take this lower triangle and without uh, any error, take it to this bigger triangle mm -hmm. without any loss and to this bigger triangle. But if we take this bigger triangle, we uh, should lose something if we try to show it on the device with this gamut, this standard gamut, it's, it's wide gamut. I hope it's understandable, sorry if not, but uh, it's not that, uh, it's not a problem most of the time. Why? Because uh, the colors is the same and most of your scenes will fall in this standard gamut and you still don't lose mm -hmm. anything. But if you shoot something like my LED or like and this blue room, blue light in this room, that uh, more likely you have a problem. And uh, next, what we need to understand is how colors is written to file. Mostly all talks about pixels. So our standard graphic file has 
the small dots called pixels. All these pixels is written with color triplets. It's three channels, R, G, and B. So red, green, and blue. And uh, most of the time when uh, talks about it, that's not. But uh, there is also the third uh, part of this uh, thing. It's metadata. So color files that contains picture mostly can, uh, can contain metadata about what color space this file has. So if we take our color triplet and we know what color space it is, we effectively know what color it was in the real world or it should be in the real world. And if we know everything about the device, we will show it on, then uh, we will produce correct color. So your monitor should be calibrated. And I know it's important team. It's maybe uh, for one more masterclass team, but let's talk about it somewhere <laughs> other time. And yeah, that but could uh, that could be its own masterclass calibrating. <laughs> yes, of course, no problem. If someone wants to hear it, I'll give it. <laughs> and uh, but I'll take it brief. So you uh, calibrated not. Uh, only your display, but the whole monitoring device that consists of your display and device, your environment, your monitoring device, or something that transfer colors from your computer to your display and device. And uh, there is two types of uh, calibration, adaptive, as I call it, and straight. It's not uh, science. It's not correct terms, I think, but uh, it's easier to understand how it works. Mm -hmm. State calibration is when we take some kind of device, we measure it, and we produce some kind of formula to take this device to a particular color space. So we have some kind of monitor, we correct it with lookup table mostly of the time, and it strictly uh, works as REC709 device or RGB device or DCI P3 projector, but it's worked only in this color space. And our software doesn't know anything about it. And adaptive system of color management is uh, was invented long time ago for print industry. So we, uh, our software know about our monitor. It know all these uh, weak points and strong points. And uh, if it know what it color is, physically it was in your file, it know your monitor, it will adapt and produce the correct output to this monitor. Mm -hmm. With uh, what? I know only three software that uh, use adaptive color management when it comes to moving picture. It's Final Cut Pro X, it's Resolve on Mac only, and it's Flame, and I think it's Flame, it's also on Mac only, but I can be wrong with this. Maybe Linux also have this ability. But your monitors uh, should be calibrated. And uh, I know the boring part <laughs> Almost ends, and let's conclude what i uh, talk about that our color management, what is color management system? The main purpose of color management system is to get our job done, and it should uh, provide us as users uh, uh, correct output to our display devices and uh, correct uh, underlying signal. So it's better to comp in linear uh, gamma. So like in real world. And it's better to create in some kind of logarithmic gamma. So these gray images. And it's better to view in standard uh, gamma created color space or what Flame calls video color space. I don't know if it has color space, but it's also, it sure calls it video. The standard, Gamma created color space that's uh, understood more for our eyes. Uh, and so we have a display color spaces, it's, uh, our display and devices co uh, 
color space it's we have working color spaces it's uh, what we can it's what's better for us as an artist to work in and we have a connecting color spaces uh, that used to convert between this color space and connecting color spaces usually try to include all this color so it has its primary green somewhere sorry it's, sorry once again green will be somewhere here blue will be somewhere here and red will be here so it contains all the colors you can see like this is primary zero uh, is it all what uh, I can take? Uh, okay, let's go to practice. And I think it will be more understandable. I'll try. On, on Valentine, does anybody have any questions? I mean, yes, there's always questions in color, in, in color management. I know for me, uh, the, the, the biggest kind of change in my thought process that I had to uh, understand when I started doing any kind of color management work was um, it's, it's all or nothing. If you're gonna work in a color managed pipeline, then you have, to, you have to tag your footage when it comes in and everything has to be tagged. Uh, and and uh, you have to really have a, a conscious understanding of what you had on that last slide, that you have a, a working color space, a display color space, and then some type of transformation that's going on. And you need to adapt or you need to change the working color space, like you said, based on what works best for what you're doing, you know, comp and linear, grade and color, that kind of thing. Okay. Grade and laws. So no grade. questions. All right. Okay. Let's Moving continue. On. Okay. Uh, and uh, do you see my resolve? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, I have a resolve project. Let's open preferences. And it's a standard color science and resolve. It's not something automated. So we need our help today and dive in. And uh, uh, I have some kinds of sources. It's mixture with that I have on my workstation. So not from one particular project. Okay, I have some Canon RAW. It's Alexa ProRes. One more Alexa Paris. One more Alexa Paris. Alexa in row. Uh, some Sony. Mm -hmm. One more Sony and some red. So we have two raw sources uh, and let's first uh, see how I interpret it. With Alexa, it's all simple. So you leave it as is and you find a goal. Alexa is pretty simple camera when it comes to workflow. And I think uh, that's why most of people love it. Canon RAW, you can have color space Canon Sigma Gamut and Gamma Canon Fox 3. Save it, sorry. Open again. And we have something wrong happens. Red. Also with red color science, I uh, the most modern uh, IPP2, red white gamut, and gamma curve uh, log 3G. Okay, first thing you need to do is to take all these uh, sources to some base uh, the same base follows this. And uh, uh, I don't know, I just used to work in Alexa color space, but it's my personal preference. It can be red, white gamut, it can be something from Canon, it can be an ACES, whatever you like. So we went to our color page and apply color transformations. And we use its Canon. Let me turn this. So we can see what our source is. It's Canon, Canon Cinema Gamut, Canon Log 3, and convert it to Alexa and Log C. So uh, it's 
if you see on my vector scope, it do something with the signal. So Alexa, we don't change much. Uh, and the Sony is S log, S log, S log three. Oh, sorry, S gamma three and S log three. And I need output S Alexa. The same with this. Yep. So Valentine, what you're doing is you you set all of the original clips to their uh, their native native space. color spaces uh, as wide as possible. So I don't clip anything uh, on rough conversion stage, raw conversion stage. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when I not tell you, but uh, let me. Turn back to my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, when you choose uh, color space you better to work with, uh, you need to think about uh, two things. Firstly, what will be your main delivery? So you uh, and uh, uh, what's your uh, input and delivery is more uh, more important than input. So. Uh, you, if your delimiter would be TV, you can easily to work in a, a standard bound, but it's also advisable to work with something that uh, wider than your delivery and only to stretch it back when you produce your master. Mm -hmm. So only on the later stage, not uh, something in between. So I try to don't touch my primaries IT and don't compress them much until I need to. So red, red, white, gamma, to and- You need to switch back to sharing the- Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, welcome to my world, man. <laughs> Me and Zoom, it's a dance. But yeah, you're setting the each clip to, to uh, be in its native color space and then- And convert uh, it to Alexa because I choose Alexa as my working mm -hmm. color space. As your working space. Yes. And uh, to see it more or less contrasty, I, sorry, uh, it's timeline level of result grading. Basically it means that uh, all I have on my timeline will be uh, taken through this node. Here it says it's timeline. Mm -hmm. So I take Alexa, log C to rec 709 and gamma 2.4. And we have some kind of more or less contrasty and understandable pictures. And if we watch this part, the shot, and police slides. It's where our problem with gamut happens. There are two ways to fight with this, and the, the easiest way to apply some kind of uh, tone mapping when you convert to your um, narrow color space. Mm -hmm. So in resolve, it happens with this. So I take you. luminance mapping, sorry, and saturation mapping to not produce some kind of. And if we compare to two methods, wow. Okay, so makes a and. Yes, and you should always grade whatever you need to grade under this uh, conversion. So you need more contrast in this picture. You easily do it. So let my hero comes to the shoot. Once again, it was TV series I grade the spring and still have permission to show it. So. 
or you can use some kind of look. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, let's say create it. And K, it can be easy transferred to another scene without problem. But uh, what we need to know is uh, where fix part of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just pre rendered it. Yes. Before we get to the VFX part of it, okay. Um, we did get a, a few questions for you in the chat. Okay. Uh, let it's me here for you to read it in the chat. Uh, uh, um, chat, uh, chat, 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 chat. Okay. Uh, or it should be in Q and A section. Uh, well, there's, there's some in both. I can tell you the first. The first question then is, uh, how do you know what options to choose from in the lists when you were going to your on the original footage and you were assigning the right color space? How do you know which one which option? Okay. If I get something uh, in raw format, then it's uh, what I choose uh, in resolve settings uh, uh, in for every camera. So I have some Canon roll and I choose how to debar it. So I choose for software to what provides for me, what I should work in it. If it's something like this Sony, and it was not raw, it's, uh, I think it was Sony F5 or F55, this ball shot. Uh, then it's only to talk with DOP or camera technicians uh, or ask someone who was on set to provide you this information, what your camera is shooting. And it's no. Uh, um, sometimes I see colleagues of rights um, in metadata and QuickTime files, uh, and most software, including Resolve, can read this information. So Resolve knows that the source was uh, in uh, Alexa Loxi and Alexa White Gamut. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it's only to talk with. DOP or something who was on set. Uh, another question for you is, uh, why not use a linear or ACES color working space? Uh, first of all, ACES can be used. I just uh, used to work with Alexa primaries. Uh, remember this shot when we fixed uh, police highlights, police traffic lights, I don't know how it's properly called. Uh, if we have this in ACES primaries, uh, it some can be pain in the ass to fix. They provide you some kind of wood that should fix it, but it's not always working. And basically I, I found that Alexa primaries is uh, more pleasant to work. It's, it's just more clever decision when RE team and ACES team have when uh, they decide what to work with. Gotcha. And linear would be used when we will comp, of course. It will be still Alexa uh, primaries, but linear under the hood. One more for you. Um, what is the best practice for comping when the client provides S-log elements, say shot with a GoPro or other kind of prosumer camera to be comped over flat or linear? Uh, like stuff shot on Phantom or Alexa. We'll uh, do it in a moment. Oh, okay, good, good, good. good. Okay. Then so maybe this so is a good transition back to VFX. Yes. So what uh, I did, I'll take this shot, and I'll go to delivery page. Sorry. And uh, and before I go to delivery page. So it's not unfeigned, it's output as individual clips, it's outputs uh, not even in, at source resolution, but it doesn't matter for my example. Uh, what we need to do in uh, this particular um, thing, because I make uh, all my manual color space decision and uh, Resolve has uh, some uh, automated since if we work in DaVinci RGB color management or some kind of ACES. I just made uh, it so manual, but uh, I 
disable this thing and I'll leave enabled uh, my color space transforms the transforms from Sony to Alexa. And I rendered this file out as a progress. And now uh, uh, let me go to Fusion. Uh, do we uh, you see Fusion now? Yes. You should see. Oh, perfect. Okay, and I just opened Fusion. So then uh, what I need, I have this clip shot on Sony originally. Then I transform it into Alexa primaries in and Alexa log C in Resolve. And I render it it's, it's as a movie file, ProRes file. You can use DPX, you can use whatever you like, just ProRes make something a little bit easier. So I remove Loxy Gamma and make this clip linear. In Fusion, it's open color IO, color space that act as source and output to linear. Just remove them. Then I need to see this clip in something that can be pleasant to work with. Once again, it's Fusion, it's uh, called uh, Gamut View LUT, where I said that I have color space. I need to add sRGB gamma to it. And when I turn it, I see it, something they, then I can work with. If I have something, uh, let me, uh, find some kind of source. Mm, okay. Let's say client wants uh, so it be shot on some kind of VCR. So then what I need to do, at least in Fusion and Flame, it would be done with one color management node when you say you have something that in Rx on sRGB and you need to comp it in ACSGG. In Fusion, it's a little bit more hard to do, but uh, I mean, it takes two nodes. First, what I need, I need gamut. I need, sorry. I need to take gamma out from this scene. And uh, it will not, it doesn't matter in uh, this particular uh, example because it's black and white. But if I have color picture to comp, I'll have the, once again the gamut effect that will change our sRGB. Where is it? To Alexa. It will not change because it's black and white once again. Mm -hmm. And then I comp it with, I don't know, soft light. Oh, well. mm, soft light. And uh, there is my effect. Because, of course, it's, uh, it's not beautiful, it's but beautiful. <laughs> it's not what I want to show. Okay, basically for demo purpose, I make next. I take there this. There we go. Yes, it's paint, just simple paint. If something doesn't show me its control, but basically one is written with uh, uh, intensity of one, two is written with intensity of two, four with intensity of four, eight with intensity of eight, 16 with int and so on and so on. And we can even try it with blur. And we know that wow. it's HDR. So everything is, what I need next, I'll bring this thing back to Alexa Loxy and render it out 
as once again as uh, progress for full for movement. But uh, let me open an After Effects, and it's uh, not what I done with Andy, but After Effects also has a color management engine. It's a little bit strange, but uh, <laughs> it works sometimes. And uh, once again, I don't know everything in internet I saw. Uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't show uh, the proper way to work in After Effects. And right. so let me join an After Effect. Okay. Almost the same shot. I mean, the same on the hood, the just different paint. Mm -hmm. uh, to work color range with color mentioned and after effect, what you need to do? You need to choose your, and well, let me show it again. There is 32 bit per channel little button here. You need to press it, mm -hmm. choose your primaries, white color gamut Alexa, Choose linearize working space and choose compensate for send referred profiles. Then you need to right click on your sources, interpret, go to color management and tell after effects that it was an Alexa. And you will good to go. So you have a linear signal under the hood. You comp like it should, so everything will work right, uh, blah, blah, blah. That and second part was the part that I never I never understood in After Effects, that you have to go to interpret footage to tell it what the, uh, to tag. And the one hit, it uh, sometimes it can be uh, blackout and doesn't work uh, because this color management only works if you provide After Effects with RGB sources. If okay. you click SMIC, or YUV, so progress for two, two, it will not work, whatever you do with it. And the last scene of puzzle, when we render it out, uh, sorry, wrong button, uh, you should also come to the color management and choose work in space, uh, blah, blah, but it's not, not work in space. Choose your Alexa here. Mm -hmm. And it will tell you that it will take uh, Alexa primaries with gamma 1.0 and convert it to approximately 3.7 or it's Alexa. <laughs> and uh, now we will back. I already rendered with these two files. And we will back to resolve. And I'll have it something here. Uh, sorry, something goes wrong. Okay. So we have to these files. And if we turn all our uh, Map it to for Rex 709. We will have it. It's the same file that can be graded, or I can even copy the grade from this file, and it will produce something that can be cut. Mm -hmm. At least in first interpretation. Of course, it need to work to not be in salt green, but. And the most important. Let's see. We have all this gradation for all of this HDR that I use it. Mm -hmm. uh, I made in After Effect or in Fusion, or you can use Flame, Nuke, whatever you like for content. Valentine, a couple of questions, uh, more questions that came in. Uh, Derek was curious, do different workspaces remove or clip any color information from the raw footage? Uh, Yes, if you have camera such as uh, Alexa uh, or Sony, you can interpret, uh, interpret its uh, primaries. Uh, okay, let's take this Canon. 
you can interpret it as the widest uh, gamut the sensor of the ca your camera has. Or you can uh, interpret it as Rec 709. So it will compressed already. But if you work uh, in use and you need to pull it away from you as fast as possible, it will be the way to work. Or you need just to make dailies uh, for editor with lots of footage. Maybe it uh, will help you to make it faster. So it's still there, it can be done, but it's not a uh, proper way to do it. Gotcha. Once again, you need to make dailies to watch on RFR TV. You choose like 2020, and it will be something right without any grading, or at least it should be right. And do you know, uh, is there any feature, is there any way to inflame to uh, to have the same tone mapping feature that you showed in Resolve? Uh, yes, ACES. Oh, OK. ACES uh, has, it's, uh, it's called uh, Reference Rendering Transform. It's basically a tone mapping. So if I, uh, sorry, transfer my project to ACES. Let me have an input like Alexa and output as Rec 709 once again. Okay. So my grade of course doesn't work, but it's not what interesting for us. Do you see it's already some kind of tone map it, mm -hmm. but in this uh, extreme conditions and uh, let me check ah it has alexa so uh, everything should work right at least it's over ah sorry i need to turn off this thing ah. here you go okay oh there we go yeah now it's right it still has some clipping, but uh, ACES, and I know that Flame also has this, it's part of ACES implementation, has this, uh, let me find it. Uh, uh, Academy Fix Highlight. Oh, there you go. And this lot fix it. Not completely, that's why it doesn't love ACES. Uh, um, yes. And I'm not so good, uh, not remember, maybe it's a way to tone map it uh, in Flame, there, there is other ways to tone map it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it can be, if I not mistake, there is something like photo, photo map transformation. Okay. Uh, it has parts of tone mapping. It definitely should have. I don't know if it still exists or not. Don't remember. Does anybody have any more questions for Valentine? All right. Well, that was great, man. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Anytime. I know every time I... Uh, I, I, I do one of these color management sessions on, on Logic Live. I learn a tremendous amount, and then I hope, <laughs> I hope that uh, I remember it when I go and actually work on a job. Uh, but fortunately, I can always go back and, and reference this stuff. And if anyone does have any questions, feel free to reach out to Valentine. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer. Yes, uh, uh, reach me on Logic Forum. Perfect. Thank you I'm Val, here, so just a uh, shot from Valentine, Val, and I'll answer you, at least I tried. Perfect. Valentine, thank you. Let's, um, I'm you're gonna, welcome. If you wouldn't mind uh, stopping your screen share. Uh, yes, okay, and. Uh, I'm going to switch over here to my trusty laptop on the side uh, and see if we can't. Let's see, go over, before we give away some prizes, uh, I wanted to just let everybody know what's coming up on Logic Live. So next weekend, 
on uh, November 8th, we have a, a, a double feature for everybody. We're going to have uh, Will Harris uh, from Autodesk on to show off the new Flame 2021.2 release. And then Andy Dill is going to give us some compositing tips. I know I personally am definitely looking forward to that. Uh, Andy's one of uh, the great contributors over on the forum, and I thank him for that, of course. November, November, yeah, November 15th, uh, we're going to interview uh, Bilali Mack, who's a, a flame artist, a VFX supervisor, and a host of the uh, Legends of VFX podcast. November 22nd, Synth Eyes for Flame Artists with Ulick. And on November 29th, we're going to close out the month with the uh, the much-anticipated Mocha Deep Dive with Dan Harvey over at Boris FX. Uh, the the uh, fellows over at Boris FX have offered up uh, a 12-month license of the entire Boris FX suite that we're going to be giving away to one lucky attendee. And that brings us into December. And on December 6th, we're going to have the lovely and talented Grant K. Followed by the man, the myth, the legend on December 13th. Tips and shtick with Tim Farrell. Uh, I see him there. I see his uh, his his uh, little icon avatar is smiling right now uh, in anticipation. So we can't wait to have him on for that. And finally, on December 20th, we're going to do the first annual Logic Live holiday celebration, which I will tell you what that is once I figure it out. <laughs> but I found it's important to set a date for these things, and then magically, uh, you know, they 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 come into being. But whatever it is, is going to be a lot of fun. I promise you. Okay. Let's see if we have set up the PowerPoint properly today. Wait. Well, there's no music today. You know, damn it. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to get this right. Perfect. Jeff, how's the level on that? Is it good? Okay. <laughs> I swear. All right, let's switch over to uh, the uh, the uh, – the name picker website, which today is brought to us by, oh, I don't want to say their name out loud, but it looks like a cloud service uh, uh, for media and content creation that many of you are probably uh, customers of. Um, and then usually there's like a foot doctor or something down here somewhere. But anyway, I have a couple things to give away today. I have a Logic phone charger. So let's see who gets the Logic phone charger. I've got everybody's name in the list here, and we're going to press start. And look at that, amazing. That's real-time animation for you. Derek Gibhart, congratulations, my friend. All right. Oh, wait, Charles Quinn, are you, are you referring to Dr. Jonathan Zismore, uh, famed dermatologist who advertised in the New York subway for 30 years? Oh, my God. I wonder what happened to Dr. Z. All right. <laughs> Congrats. Maybe I don't want to know what happened to Dr. Z. <laughs> Congratulations, Derek. Uh, and now I have the first of what will be several uh, Logic.TV masks, courtesy of our friends at Cinesis.io. So let's pick another name. Oh, my God, Charles Quinn himself. Uh, there's a modeling photo I cannot wait to see. You know what? Let's do one more mask. All right, we'll do one more mask. Here we go. Round and round she goes. Where she stops, nobody knows. I don't know why I've given this a gender, but... And Britt Campa, congratulations, Britt. Wait, is Britt here? Britt is not here. I, re you know, I retract my congratulations, and he'll certainly regret not joining Logic Live today. You know, we need the sound effect of like the big wheel. You know, Kevin, you're here, right? Yes, congratulations, Kevin. All right, awesome. I will send you guys uh, emails to get your mailing addresses, and we will get all that over to you. Uh, in fact, Derek, I'm going to throw one of these here, Logic.TV Logic masks, in with your in your with your phone charger. So uh, everybody's a winner. So thank you very much. Congratulations, everybody. Let's go back to the to the uh, PowerPoint and close this out. Oh, you know what? I completely forgot. Of course, to add, uh, of course, everybody who gets one of these uh, items, please send in a picture. Okay, and you can be as cool as Carrie and uh, and Marion. I do love showing, wait a minute. Right, and of course Mindy and Peter over in Thailand and the uh, those those would be the, de the delicate visual effects hands of Quinn Richardson down at the bottom there. And uh, you know who joined this week of course was Jeff Kyle coming in from New York, New York and Sibylla from California. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you guys got your, got your chargers and thank you for sending in pictures. Oh, Jeff, you're famous. As long as you're not infamous, right? Like the rest of us. 
<laughs> stay pure. So again, everybody, thank you for, uh, for uh, helping to make the forum all that it is. And please continue to contribute. Forum.logic.tv. If you're not a member, please head over and sign up. And this episode and all other uh, Logic Live episodes will be on uh, Logic.tv as soon as I can get that up there. I'm working on it. It's uh, if, if, if I know Valentine has heard me say I'm, I'm, I'm on a job from hell right now, and I just have not had time. But uh, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, they're available on Apple Podcast, um, Stitcher, and now Spotify. Please subscribe to their YouTube channel if you haven't already. And of course, thanks as always to Synesis for their support. Synesis.io, solutions development, integration, and support. Supporting Flame Artists since 1997. That's going to do it for Logic Live this week, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much. There's the inspirational music. It was delayed, Jeff, but it was there. <laughs>